We are going through a series on loving your enemies is the subject today. The, the series is about the difficult sayings, the hard sayings of Jesus. Because some things that Jesus says, you look at it and you think, well, how does that make sense? And I don't really understand that. And today we're looking at loving your enemies. Uh, and it, it's a tremendous text. It's kind of difficult to understand. Um, but let's, let's look at it. Jesus said this, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. And if somebody takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that, uh, love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do Lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get back anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for this challenge to us today. I pray that you would open our ears and eyes and help us to uh, understand. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Of all the sayings that we've been looking at in this series, I think this one is the most um, well-known. Loving your enemies, turning the other cheek. Now, I don't know how you were raised. I was raised a little bit different than that. I remember when I was a kid, my dad got us boxing gloves, okay? And me and my brothers would wind up boxing. I guess he wanted us to learn how to defend ourselves. But usually the boxing match progressed quickly into a complete meltdown. And and my dad used to teach us, if somebody was to slap you, how would you respond to that? You would give it back. You would get, you'd knock them out. You know, my dad just taught me that. He said, uh, you bully a bully. Has anybody ever learned that? You heard that? You bully a bully. And so my question here is what Jesus is teaching here is he teaching people to be weak. I mean, I'm just being honest. Is this what he's teaching? I don't think so. I think, though, that we misconstrue it that way. We misconstrue it to see Jesus kind of like the picture that is on a lot of walls of an anemic Jesus who was weak. That's not what he is teaching here. What he's teaching here is a great balance. You might think of it as uh, not just two things being balanced, but several things being balanced in the ethical and moral system that Jesus creates. And if you look at other religions, you'll see all kinds of good teaching. In fact, Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a book about this once called The Abolition of Man, and he put together a comparison of all the different religious teachings of the different religions. He called it the Tao. These common ethical and moral principles that human conduct uh, have been guided by, but when it got to this one, loving your enemies and turning the other cheek, he said, none of the other religions have this. This is on another level to actually love your enemies, to turn your cheek when you're slapped and not hit back. And and this is really, really intense. And it's above what other religions teach. And so this is this balance. Now, you can't say, I don't think, that Jesus is just saying weak, because Jesus, on the one hand, denounces injustice. In the verses 25 and 26, which come before the 27 when you read, Jesus was coming against injustice. He said, woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to when, 
Uh, everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. And he, he, t he does this very strong words. He talks, you know, with, with heaviness about this is going to happen to you if you are like this. Because justice is important to him. But on the other hand, he says, love your enemy. You know, he says that uh, if your enemy has done something to you, you don't, you don't hit back. Luke 6, 27, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And you look at this and you think, well, that's different than what the Old Testament teaches. Well, you know, it's, it's not really. I mean, there are different verses in the Old Testament that talk differently than this. It talks about an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, yes. But there's also Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8, uh, he, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? He requires this, to act justly and to love mercy. Both of those, to be, go for justice and go for mercy, and the third part, walk humbly with God. And so there's a balancing thing of that, yes, you want to stand for justice. You don't let injustice happen. You want to stand for mercy at the same time. And there's this book of Job where Job talks about his life and how he, he balanced this idea of being merciful as well as being strong. And uh, Job says that the, in 20, chapter 29, whoever heard me spoke well of me, talking about himself. He said, Who's, who saw me commended me because I rescued the poor. You can ask yourself, do you do these things? Uh, rescued the poor who cried for help? And the fatherless who had none to assist them, I helped them. The one who was dying, uh, bless me, I made the widow's heart sing. That's a great testimony. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. And I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger, but I also did this. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. Pretty strong there. And so there's this combination, even the Old Testament, of you being standing for justice, don't let people walk over you ever, or walk over others, and yet you are merciful. Now, when we look at this, and we think about how to respond to this, there's typical responses, the way uh, people respond when somebody is mistreating you. And maybe you lean toward more than the other. One response to somebody who mistreats you is the passive response. And this would be kind of like this. If somebody slaps you on the cheek, what do you do? You put the cheek back out there, the same cheek. And you, you respond by not responding. You don't complain. You don't speak up. You don't rebuke. You don't confront. There's people who understand family systems theory and therapists who understand this, and they say that it's more painful to change the status quo than to confront. And so there are people who just keep taking the hits because they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to change things. They don't want to rebuke and say they continually. Jesus didn't say do this. He didn't say you just keep putting out the other cheek, which, by the way, I want to think about this for a second. Um, this whole image of if somebody slaps you on the cheek, now I don't know anything about martial arts. I Don't laugh, I don't. But if somebody was going to say, I want you to take this person out, they probably would not say, go for the cheek. You know? If they hit him in the nose or maybe the throat or the solar plexus or somewhere else, uh, I don't know where, but they wouldn't say slap the cheek and they wouldn't say slap. You want to take somebody out, you punch them or hit them or kick them. And so slapping was more than just somebody doing you violence. Somebody is dishonoring you. In Matthew, it says if somebody hits you on the right cheek. Now, most people are right-handed. And if somebody's going to hit you on the right cheek, what does that mean? It means you backslap them. And so Jesus is saying if somebody backslaps you, do you just put that same cheek out again, let them backslap you again? No. He says, turn the other cheek. But the passive response is a common response. Now, another common response people have is the vindictive response. 
I think of this, you might call it the uh, vengeance response. If somebody strikes you on the back, uh, on the cheek, you, you respond by you hit them back. Maybe you hit them a lot harder. You just, you know, that's how you respond. And somebody makes you feel bad, you make them feel bad. It's just, it, this is where a lot of it's been taught. Now that there's another response, it's not just one or two responses. There's a combo. There's uh, the delayed explosive response, which, by the way, is kind of mine. Honest, really. You take, you take it, you take it, you take it. Somebody is doing mean stuff to you, abusing you, do, saying dishonoring things to you. And you take it, you take it, and take it. And finally, uh, you respond. Delayed, explosive response. Maybe that's how you are. And then there's this, the part, the people who are this, passive and vengeful at the same time. And don't laugh at this, because this is the scary folks. They're the folks who smile at you, and inside they are burning with rage. They're the folks who take their gun in at work and shoot people. They have this inside them, and they're, they're outside, they look fine, but they're not. And they're being overly passive to people who come against them, and they're turning the same cheek over and over to them. At the same time, inside, they're burning with rage. And, and this is not what Jesus is saying either. You know, he says, don't just keep turning the same cheek. He says, turn the other cheek. Um, example of this. Um, Tim Keller tells a story about listening to this, uh, this conversation. He overheard this one-way conversation. You know, this woman was on her cell phone, and she was talking to her dad, and he couldn't help but hear. It was, uh, they were in a restaurant, and it was quiet, but he could hear her. And, and in the, she, he could tell the conversation was getting intense. And she was quiet for a moment, and she said, Dad, I want you to know, I've told you before, I cannot allow you to talk to me like that or Mom like that. I've told you before that I won't put up with it, and therefore I'm going to hang up on you right now, right in the middle of that sentence. I want you to know that I care for you, I love you, I really want to have a good relationship with you, and if you're willing to change, I'm willing to connect with you, and I'll call you back later. I care a lot about you. And then she hung up. And what did she do there? She wasn't passive. Just say, okay, Dad. And let him talk to her in a demeaning way. He didn't content. She didn't say, well, he's my dad. I'm just going to let him do that. Not rock the boat. After all, he's my father. Or she could have said, oh, you blankety blank blank. I'm sick of you. I'm never talking to you again. This is what I think of you. And slammed the phone down. She didn't do that either. She had this response that was different than that. It was a, a response of turning the other cheek. It was a, a response that was an active response, but it wasn't an active with vengeance. It was a wanting her father to change. It was a courageous and I think sometimes we've been uh, thinking passive responses are courageous. You know, I mean, sometimes people who are passive think they're being courageous. They think, you know, I take a lot of abuse, and it's very hard, but I love this person, and I know if I did anything and said anything, they'd blow up, so I'm just going to take it because I'm a Christian. That's not courageous. That's what Scott Peck called pseudo-community. Living in a relationship where nobody rocks the boat. You know, if you're going to go to the eastern shore, let's say you like sunny beaches and you want to go to the campground over there. We've been over there, the campground. You know, before you go there, you have to go through a tunnel under the water. And some of us don't like getting in small, enclosed places. But to enjoy the eastern shore, you have to go through that. And to be in a relationship with another person that's healthy and it's one in which it's safe, Sometimes you have to deal with issues that you don't want to deal with. You have to deal with some things that, oh man, I don't want to do that. 
and it's going to be uncomfortable, and there's going to be conflict, but you got to do it. And you know, usually when I'm working on text, this is about the time when I talk about practical applications of what we're looking at. But today I want to do different than that. Instead of talking about practical applications, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about well, what happens, what's the, what's the theory behind this? I mean, why should we love our enemies? Why is it? Well, there's several reasons, I believe, that why we should do it. First, hate for hate only intensifies the amount of hate and evil in the world. I mean, isn't that true? The more you hate, you do it more, they do it more, it just continues. If you hate like somebody hates you, it's going to make more hate. It's just the way things work. Imagine you're driving, let's say you're driving uh, to Richmond, and it's night, and uh, let's say you're not taking the highway, you're taking, I guess, Richmond Road or something, you're going that way, and uh, let's say you're driving, and every time you pass a car, they have their high beams on, okay? And you're, let's say you're riding with your spouse or your friend, and they keep doing that. Every time you pass a car, they get their high beams on, and the person drives says, okay, that's it. Next time I come across somebody who's got their high beams on, I'm going to put my high beams on and slam them on as bright as I can do it. What would you say? What, are you crazy? Somebody's got to dim the lights. And we live in a world where everybody's doing that to each other. We, 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 we put the bright lights on. We, we try to blind them, and that goes on and keeps going on, and it, it, it intensifies the hate. Gosh, how many times do you see this on social media? <laughs> I mean, how often does it blow up? And somebody says something, and then somebody says something else, and it just builds, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Happens all the time. Hate for hate. Not what Jesus says to do. Second, hate distorts the personality of the hater. You know what changes you? If you are hating, if you're a hater of something somebody else does, they control you. The bitterness in your heart controls you. And you might say, you know, I'd like to go there, but I remember she used to go there, and I'm never going there again. I'd like to do that, but they like to do that, and so he liked to do and I'm not ever going to do it again. And you're allowing somebody else to control you. If you hate, if you give in to this feeling of bitterness, and it, it distorts you. It causes you blood pressure issues, physical issues. It, it hurts you if you fall into this trap of being bitter. Third, love has a redemptive power. It absolutely does. You know, uh, years ago, Abraham Lincoln, he had a lot of people when he was running the office, did not like him. And there was one person in particular, Edward Stanton, that said all kinds of terrible things about him, made fun of the way he looked. He called him the original gorilla. He, called, he, said, he, he said he was so ugly. And he said all kinds of mean things about Lincoln. And yet, when Lincoln had to get a cabinet and he had to find a secretary of war because he knew that the country was going probably into a civil war, he hired Stanton to be on his cabinet. He appointed him on his cabinet. Somebody came to him and said, Lincoln, you know he hates your guts. Why would you do that? He said, I need the best man to do the job, and he's the best man. And so Stanton worked with Lincoln. And they worked together for several years. And at the end of the war, somebody took his life, Lincoln's life. Stanton was there. And at the, after he died, Stanton said, this is a man who will live for the ages. And Stanton did everything in his power to find who it was that did it. And he learned such respect for Lincoln. There's something about loving another person that can change the other person. When I was in school, I had this one professor who was like a drill instructor. That's who he was, and he was really harsh. And there was this one guy in our in our class that was uh, always apologetic, you know, and this teacher did not like that. And uh, 
So anyway, the teacher and him did not get along, and, um, and then the teacher got sick, and he got cancer. And uh, this student helped this teacher in so many ways. He, he taught his class, he graded his papers, he went to the hospital and checked on him, just, he, he made him, his wife made him food, just over and over again, this student did things of kindness. And it changed their relationship because love has a redemptive power. It may not always work, but it does. And fourth, and this is the most important, why should you love your enemies? Why should you turn the other cheek? Because God loved us when we were his enemy. And you might say, well, I was, I never thought of myself as the enemy of God. Do you believe what the Bible says? Romans 5 says this, For while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. You see, all of us have been. We do it in different ways. Sometimes we do it when we think, well, God needs to do this for me. You might think, you know, I... I wanted to be married by now, and how come God hadn't given me that person? Or, or I wanted to have a better job than this, and how, how come God didn't answer this? Or, or you, there's something else in your life, and you think, oh, why didn't God do this? Listen, God is the creator of the universe. He knows all things. He is all good. And sometimes we are disconnected to him because we go against what he teaches, really. But while we were enemies, we were reconciled through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That God has loved us, even though in many ways we've gone against him and forgiven us in so many ways. And so we are not to just be passive when somebody comes against us and just keep turning the same cheek. We're not supposed to be violent and aggressive and hit the other person in the nose. We're supposed to Turn the other cheek. Because you see, if somebody slaps you backhanded and you turn the other cheek, you're saying, no more will you dishonor me in that way. So you stand up, but you stand up not with hate in your heart. You stand up against the evil action, but not with a sense of malice and ill intent to the other person. And so that's why I'm not a pacifist. I don't think that the Bible specifically teaches that. I think that we do respond appropriately when people come and do things to us. Now, you may ask yourself, because we are living in the age right now, what's going on in the Ukraine? How does this work on a global scale? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand it. And there are some times I don't know. Um, I know Reinhold Niebuhr, he wrote about this, and he said this a crazy man is out of control driving a car and running over people. As a Christian, you're just, your job is to help the people the car has hidden, have been, that has been hit by the car, and also to stop the person driving the car. And it is unbelievable some of the awfulness that we see going on every day right now. The bombing of innocent people and hospitals and children's hospitals, maternity wards, and I do not understand it. And I pray for it, and that's what we should pray for. But I do know this. If we respond with hate in our hearts, it's not the answer. Hate begets hate. So we have to do the best that God's called us to do, to do justice and to love kindness, the balance of both. Jesus died for us while we were yet his enemies. And so we should do what the prophet Micah says. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the strength to do what you ask us to do because we can't do it on our own. None of us here have the ability. We're all weak. And it's only through your Holy Spirit to give us the strength to, to follow your words that any of us be able to do this. 
For some of us, we feel naturally the passive type. For others, we feel naturally the aggressive type. Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to follow the way that you teach. I pray that your Holy Spirit may help us to seek justice with mercy in every relationship, in every experience we have. And Lord, we pray for what's going on in Ukraine. We pray that it may come to an end quickly. We ask your Holy Spirit to work in that situation. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.